Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the joint uh, Thai event, Lao and Timor-Leste Day. Um, I'd like to give a, a little bit of background of the, of the project, uh, two projects for you. This project is uh, uh, these two projects that the two, two countries uh, have been uh, conducting at the ground level. It's uh, funded by LDCF. It is the wider part of our NAPA National uh, Adaptation Program of Actions. Uh, our two countries uh, share a similar uh, implementation at the ground level. Um, today, we are going to present to you how, how we really do it at the, at, in the country, building climate resilience infrastructure combined with the nature-based uh, solution, such as ecosystem-based ad adaptation and watershed management initiatives. Uh, this is to help uh, strengthen our community's resilience to adapt to climate change. My speakers today are Mr. Miguel de Cauejo, the Director of General Urban Management, Ministry of State Administration, Timor-Leste. The second one, Mr. Devin Danos Bison, Chief Technical Advisor, UNDP, Timor-Leste. My third uh, speaker is Mr. Wansai Butanawong, uh, the Director of uh, Adaptation Division of uh, Climate Change. And my last uh, speaker today is Mr. Aldous yeah. Poulsen, Chief Technical Advisor, UNDP, Lao. Um, before we go into the presentation from two countries, I would like, we would like to show you some uh, photo, sto photo story first.
thank you. Um, next, uh, I think I would like to ask the, our Timo team to present to make the first presentation. I would like to uh, keep on the questions for the last session for Q and A, just to save time. Uh, after Timo, I would like to also uh, invite the Lao team, and then we keep Q and A for the last session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. Uh, moderator, uh, good uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you all for showing up today because it's the uh, last day of the <coughs> site events, uh, and I'm glad that we still have uh, quite a few turnout for uh, today's uh, uh, session. Uh, first of all, I would also like to uh, acknowledge the presence of the Vice Minister for uh, uh, Environment from the Lao PDR. Uh, and also the delegation, all distinguished speakers and moderators and all, all, the, all, all the distinguished uh, participants. Um, <clears throat> uh, for, allow me in a 15 minutes to share with you um, uh, some experiences that Timor-Leste has uh, in relation to the um, uh, uh, activities in adaptation and mitigation that we've done in relation to the climate change uh, in this world, particularly in, in, in Timor-Leste. Timor-Leste, as you can see from the map uh, over there, it's, uh, it's, a, it's one of the youngest nations in the world and, uh, and also the least uh, developed countries in the Asian Pacific region. Uh, and it's also grappling with the uh, devastating impacts of uh, climate change. 70% of our 1.3 million people uh, lives in the uh, rural areas. Uh, many are in the mountainous uh, and also coastal areas and uh, that are highly vulnerable to the climate risks such as uh, floods, uh, uh, droughts, and erosion, and also landslide. Uh, and those conditions that I just mentioned uh, made it uh, challenges for us to develop uh, basic infrastructure in the country, uh, such as roads, water supply system, uh, etc. Um, we are working to address our development challenges, uh, while at the same time also confronting with the climate change uh, impact. <clears throat> a document that we can see from the slide over there, it's the strategic development plan of the government of Timor-Leste uh, of 2011-2030 that sets up a vision for Timor-Leste uh, uh, in an integrated package of strategic policies to be implemented in a short, medium, and long term. Uh, uh, and it's aligned with the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and which sets out a pathway to a long-term and sustainable, inclusive development in Timor-Leste. In addition, uh, Timor-Leste also been uh, actively pursuing the implementation of the NAPA, the National Adaptation Program of Action uh, on Climate Change, with highlight key, key priorities in uh, infrastructure development. Several uh, adaptations have been prioritized in the NDC, uh, which mainly focusing on redu reducing the impacts of uh, climate change, uh, promoting sustainable development, and also reducing poverty. Now, while, while the country has placed a great emphasis on the prioritization of the infrastructure uh, investment uh, uh, in the design and, uh, of the project itself, one thing that I would like to mention also here is that the human resources capacity uh, in the country when it comes to the climate change issue uh, needs uh, continuous uh, strengthening. And this has been an ongoing uh, sort of process since the country uh, gained its independence back in 2002, like 15 years ago. Uh, Timor-Leste National Determined Contribution, uh, NDC, also proposed um, adaptation measure uh, relevant to rural development and have been uh, prioritized in the NDC focusing on reducing uh, the impact of climate change, promoting sustainable development and, and reducing poverty. Um, this slide show to us, uh, show to you all uh, about the challenges that are uh, that, that, that faced by the Timor-Leste. And uh, the challenges facing Timor-Leste are further compounded by the fact that 80% of the land, 80% of the land is mountainous with very steep uh, slopes and coastal areas that are highly vulnerable to the climate change. As I mentioned, 70% of the population of 1.3 million people in the country lives in the rural areas, and they are all vulnerable to the climate change. 
uh, the country has two seasons, wet and dry. However, uh, sorry, wet and uh, dry. But however, extreme events such as uh, unpredicted rainfall, etc., uh, is having a huge impact uh, in the livelihoods of the rural population. Now, is other issues such as uh, loose soil makes it also difficult and costly to build a sustainable infrastructure and compounded by the climate-related hazard of frequent landslide and erosion. For, for irrigation, uh, the issue is that the soil are uh, permeable and due to the poor water retention potential, uh, an unstable landscape makes it difficult to build dams and develop uh, water storage. Um, Timor Leste I mean, is made of uh, uh, approximately 442 villages with a population in every village is uh, ranging from I mean, a minimum of 30, 350 people, but it can get up to 60,000 uh, 60, people I mean, in, the, in, the, in the urban area. Uh, and the, those communities are dispersed. Uh, and for that, it requires uh, significant capital investment to provide solid infrastructure to the villages that are isolated with a with relatively small population. Almost the entire uh, rural population depends on uh, subsistence agriculture for uh, livelihoods and uh, practices largely traditional with uh, slash and burn. Uh, and many of the rural infrastructure are within or adjacent to farmlands. Now, despite uh, the annual uh, infrastructure budget, I mean, uh, allocated to the rural area of approximately 35% uh, of the national budget, uh, a big infrastructure deficit still exists, eh, particularly in the rural communities. Therefore, uh, effective prioritization uh, of capital investment and partnering with the key players are uh, crucial uh, to achieve the country's 2030 targets. The lack of uh, physical assets also, uh, uh, is therefore further compounded by the frequent occurrences of climate change related disasters such as I mentioned landslide erosion and uh, drought as well as flooding uh, further weaken or destroy uh, those that uh, exist. Now these conditions have posed significant challenges for planning, developing and, and sustaining basic infrastructure that directly impacting both communities, uh, livelihoods and also national development goals. Um, this slide shows to us uh, what's been uh, the investment made at the rural area in Timor-Leste. Up to over the last seven years, uh, after the, uh, over the last seven, seven years, approximately 350 million US dollar uh, uh, allocated by the state government, or central government, in order to finance uh, rural development in in the country. And most of the, uh, in addition to um, investment made by the uh, development partners, most of the rural development in the country is, uh, is, is, is done or is invested by the, by the, by the central government. Using two uh, important mechanisms that you can see from the slide over there called P PNDS and, uh, and PNDA, P PDIM. So the PNDS is actually a, a village development program which basically, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the government actually says that all the infrastructure projects that are less than 50,000 US dollar uh, will have to be implemented by the communities at the village level. And now, now this village is not part of the government. They are uh, community organizations. So state actually, the government actually give all the infrastructure development to the village of less than 50,000 US dollar to be managed by the village. However, those that are more than 50,000 to 500,000 US dollars are to be managed by the municipal uh, government, uh, and that's, uh, as I mentioned, uh, f financed by the, by the central government. Despite significant investment, uh, uh, many of the rural community are still behind uh, expectation for social and economic service delivery and infrastructure. However, uh, added to the already limited infrastructure asset in rural communities, climate change is posing severe threats to those exist and to the new ones that's been built. Therefore, government recognizes it's very important to work with the development partners such as UNDP uh, uh, to implement projects funded by the GEF, LC, LDCF, focusing on strengthening small-scale rural infrastructure and local government uh, system. Now, as part of the project uh, mainstreaming uh, activities, 
uh, of climate change. Uh, local authorities and villages, as I mentioned, uh, they are involved uh, in, the, in the implementation of the uh, climate change adaptation planning activities. So communities are involved in, in developing the climate change adaptation planning, uh, uh, which focusing on the climate change awareness and advocacy, asset mapping to identify community assets, capacity building for uh, planning and uh, implementation of new project, and also practical training for soil bioengineering, which uh, was uh, effective in promoting community participation, public awareness, and skills development on the use of plants and lo locally available materials for implementing uh, slope protection and also soil stabilization measure. Uh, PDIM planning guidelines now, uh, I mean, this is the planning guidelines that is at the municipal level, uh, now include uh, includes uh, environmental and climate change consideration uh, uh, and, and also an integral aspect of the project prioritization and planning to prepare the annual municipality investment plan. Previously, I mean, before the GF program uh, implemented in, in the country three years ago, uh, what the, every project built at the municipal level uh, is, 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 for, is only for the sake of building the project without considering climate change issue into the, into the project. But the, G, the GFL uh, SSRI project that's been implemented in the country over the last four years has given a, 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 an input for the government in order to include in the planning guidelines to include environmental and climate change consideration as part of the planning process. So that's, that's been implemented in the three municipality which later on will be shared by the, Dave. My last slide. Uh, <laughs> Is, uh, is, uh, is about uh, uh, while the challenges are numerous in the country, but there are also opportunities. Huh? The government uh, of Timor-Leste is collaborating uh, and working with development partners on a multitude uh, of development initiatives. Partnership with these institutions and agencies are key to advancing the poverty alleviation and also development agenda for Timor-Leste. Post-conflict countries like Timor-Leste, ladies and gentlemen, have had to deal with issues of uh, policies, environment, institutional system, limited resources, including skill, personal, and scarcity of capable contractors to deliver infrastructure projects. This is why <coughs> uh, support provided by development partners during the transition and post-conflict uh, era, uh, and which continues up to today, have been vital to ensuring the implementation of sustainable development initiative. A good example is how we are working together with the UNDP later on, you will see, uh, is the strengthening, the project on the strengthening the resilience of small-scale rural infrastructure project, which is uh, uh, funded by GF, uh, uh, with the, which is partner with, which we are partnering with the Ministry for Commerce, Industry and Environment of the Government of Timor-Leste, as well as with the UNDP. And uh, at the community level, the project has been developing the capacity of community and uh, local administration to integrate climate change resilience into the planning and prioritization uh, of rural infrastructure. While uh, process for improvement focus on the entire planning and budgeting, the pilot project that uh, later on you will see in three municipalities uh, uh, are focusing on the water supply system, uh, rural access roads and bridges, uh, reservoir and also irrigation system, as well as flood protection. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, this project has provided us with important lessons and best practices through a learning by doing approach as, uh, as to why we build a better, more resilient, uh, more climate resilient uh, infrastructure. Uh, and it's all, well, it's too early to be able to compare the impact of the climate proving intervention. However, we'll continue to monitor uh, how these piloted infrastructure are standing up for climate hazards uh, in the future. Now, up to this time, uh, however, because this project has been implemented in the country for the last three years, we have seen that uh, water supply projects are better able to provide uh, water to beneficiaries in the dry periods. Roads are now better able to stand up to you know, extreme events, as we, can, as, as we saw on the, um, the video that I mean, at the start of this presentation. And also, uh, the irrigation schemes uh, are more responsive now to farmers' uh, demand for, for water. 
I think I'll stop here uh, um, because there will be a, a detailed presentation on the project by my, my colleague Dave from Timor Leste later on. I thank you all for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>
There is another project that is building resilience along a main corridor connecting three municipalities in Timor-Leste. And the one that you've just seen where we are strengthening small-scale rural infrastructure in Timor-Leste. What we did is that we developed the project with three components of policy and advocacy, another component in capacity development and building institution capacity to develop and uh, plan and implement infrastructure, and uh, where there was an, another element of implementation where infrastructure were designed, developed, and implemented to showcase resilience in these infrastructure. The first thing that was done is that we developed and prepared the vulnerability assessment for the uh, municipalities that were being um, targeted. And there were three municipalities. And uh, for uh, landslides, erosion, and flooding, the vulnerability assessment were developed. And uh, we find out what were the um, impact that uh, these uh, vulnerability, these uh, climate hazards were having on infrastructure and uh, landslides, erosion, as you would have seen, uh, water supply are being threatened by drought, irrigation are being threatened by flooding, um, roads are being destroyed by landslides and erosion. So these are the issues that rural infrastructure are facing in Timor-Leste. In this project, in the, the component where we were doing and present in the demonstration aspect, we had um, infrastructure where uh, done in uh, roads, water supply, irrigation, and, um, and roads. And uh, 20 such infrastructure were, were, de were developed and uh, implemented in um, rural communities. So one important aspect of uh, these infrastructure is what we call soil bioengineering, and was used in con in uh, combination with the hard civil engineering measures and involve the implementation of uh, methods, civil engineering methods combined with nature-based solution to build the resilience of these infrastructure. Most of the rivers in Timor-Leste are, are usually dry and uh, only um, flow when there is extreme rainfall. So river embankment have a tendency to fail because of the high velocity that usually flow in instances of flash floods and also extreme strong um, flow. So one of the things that was done is that a combination of gabions along with uh, using natural vegetation to strengthen these uh, rural infrastructure, particularly river embankments and flood water supply system were also uh, looked at the various components that were affected by the various uh, risks that you see, and mostly water supply were affected with, uh, by flooding, not flooding, drought, and, and uh, the, some components were affected by landslides. So how do we build the resilience of these infrastructure? Um, for uh, drought in particular, we had to evaluate and look at multi-use water supply system where communities were not only using the water supply system for drinking purpose or domestic purpose, they were using it also because 70% of Timor-Leste is in the rural communities and they depend on rural uh, agricultural, traditional agricultural practices and lively, livestock for their livelihood and they were using the water supply for those purposes too and the system had to be designed and developed for multi-use purposes. We found that those systems that were designed and developed, including those elements for additional uh, capacity and supply of water in instances where there is a low supply, were very resilient and were able to provide additionality and additional water supply during those times. In Timor-Leste, there is uh, more than 50% of the roads are in, in poor condition. Um, this, there is a concept of build back better. What we are saying in Timor-Leste is that since majority of the infrastructure are in poor condition, it is better, like the roads, 50% of the roads need uh, 
uh, rehabilitation or construction, it is to build better now. If we are to build better now, it means that infrastructure that are to be designed and implemented should incorporate all the resilient elements that we are talking about and we, we looked at. So some of the, some of the, uh, the projects also used community. Community were involved in the bioengineering aspect. NGOs were involved and private contractors also were involved in building resilience and providing bioengineering. We compared these three elements and we found that uh, the NGOs, local NGOs, were more effective in implementing bioengineering solution. They were better able to work with the community and implement that. I just want to share one slide. Water Aid was supposed to be here today. Un unfortunately, they couldn't be here, so I will just share a few points uh, on behalf of Water Aid is that uh, the focus is on sustainable community managed water sanitation and hygiene services, um, community management of shared water resources, and understanding water quality. Um, gender is an important consideration. Obviously, gender is important in, in climate resilient infrastructure. And uh, this is one area where we found that water supply system were more beneficial and uh, affecting uh, women and children in in uh, the communities they were, were developed and implemented. Um, the re replanting and improving water source catchment is an important aspect of replenishing uh, water supply in where there are instances uh, of, of it drying, drying out. I just want to close by sharing some lessons on climate resilience that we have uh, been able to, to gather from implementing this project. It is a small project, 4.9 million funded by the Jeff. Usually, um, infrastructure projects are very large projects. And uh, what we found is that the legislation, technical specification, standards, conditions of contract for infrastructure are not um, geared to implementing climate resilience. So technical specifications do not incorporate bioengineering and other resilience elements. So it is uh, very difficult sometimes to hold contractors, private contractors in particular, accountable to the implementation. And GCF and GEF and other um, multilateral agencies and institutions will be putting a lot of funding to, um, to resilient infrastructure. And these are uh, elements that also need to be looked at. Resilience and adaptation measures need to be prioritized at all stages and not only in the planning stage or not only in the implementation um, stage it should be prioritized at all stages in the project life cycle. And uh, we have seen cases where uh, contractors could not be held accountable and they were focusing on the hard infrastructure element and the green elements or the bioengineering and other climate resilient elements were not prioritized. Therefore, less emphasis was placed on the climate resilient component of these small infrastructure. Climate resilient infrastructure must be delivered on time and on target. As we see, um, project needs, I mean, there are lots of delays and issues with infrastructure project in general if they're not properly planned and implemented, but for climate resilience infrastructure to be effective, they have to be delivered on time because um, the climate is changing within the implementation period as well. We have seen cases where within the period of project being designed and planned and implemented, two years have elapsed, and between that time, the project scope has changed. And there is no provision in the contract for contingency sum that would take care of that additional scope. So if the road collapsed during the time of planning and implementation, which two years have elapsed, there was no allocation for that. Partnership at all levels is key to achieving greater uh, results and benefit, and the key to tackling climate resilient uh, development is through partnership. It is beneficial in minimizing the input so we could maximize the output. Uh, we found that this project was uh, being uh, just uh, implemented with two uh, ministries. Um, we had to leverage partnerships with other ministries and projects that are working in Timor Leste to maximize the output and benefits that we were having. In, in fact, when infrastructure projects are like $4.9 million compared to uh, other projects, infrastructure projects that are getting very large financing, little emphasis is being placed 
on these small infrastructure, and they are unable to influence policies, regulations, and, uh, and standards. Teams and agencies need to work collaboratively, establishing partnership with like-minded partners and related project has provided important lessons for us. Um, each partner has different strengths. They have different strategic interests. So working with NGOs is different from working with local and national government and also working with uh, communities. So we were able to leverage partnership across all levels of society and uh, have better uh, Im impact with these infrastructure. Another uh, lesson we found is that for resilient infrastructure to be effective, we have to seek out champions. Advocating for change and creating awareness require champions at national and local government levels, private sector, and civil society also, and not uh, only at, at one level. Continuous learning and capacity building has been one also lesson we have learned. This project has embarked on South-South Cooperation Exchange Program with Vietnam and Laos through the Laos Cooperation. We are here today sharing some more experiences, and these uh, are all very relevant in the, now that climate resilient infrastructure is a, a gradually evolving concept uh, in, in today. For countries like Timor-Leste, financing is key to implementation and uh, small scale rural infrastructure some, can sometimes be overlooked, overlooked as its ability to influence in, in institutional reform and policy changes can sometimes be challenging. So these are some of the lessons we have learned while we were working with the local development planning process, as uh, the Director General would have mentioned. We have experienced several challenges in trying to influence the national and local policy framework and also uh, standard specification for implementing rural infrastructure in Timor-Leste. Uh, there is, the, we have heard throughout the, the COP uh, about many uh, financing being put to the Caribbean and other countries to build back better. In the case of Timor-Leste, where it's now gradually and rapid uh, working on its rural infrastructure and large investment in its uh, large, inf large investment in large-scale infrastructure, we think that it is right now, the time is right to build better now instead of waiting to build back better. So I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for lesson learned and information from Timor Leste. Next, I would like to invite Lao team to share with you the experience from Lao PDR. Thank you, Sasumpon. Good afternoon. Uh, Madam Budkam Bolajit, the Vice Minister of uh, Minister of Natural Resources and Environment. Lao PDR. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of LDCF projects, I would like I would like to thank you very much for our ministers, Ministry of the Environment and Natural Resources and Environment to allow us to prepare for a SAI event here in Bonn. Uh, and I also really thank you very much for the Secretariat of the UNFCCC to very good uh, cooperation and support and very convenience. Also, thank you very much for the participants today for your time and attention. As may you know, Lao PDRs, Lao is small, small countries and Laos is landlocked countries. There are 80% of uh, percent, 80 percent of country is mountain. So regarding the climate change, impact from climate change for Laos, uh, yes, the flood and drought, there's most, mostly, the particularly southern part of Laos that uh, uh, our project based in Salawan and Sekong province. Our projects uh, we st started since 2000, 
2013 and we will close this the end of this year is mostly five 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 years old projects the purpose of the, our project that we we are uh, we focusing the three components component one is we we making the capacity building in planning investment for small scale infrastructure in water sectors for the second components of the project is we focusing to uh, investment for small scale infrastructure infrastructures for two uh, provinces in 12 districts and for the third components is we are uh, focusing to the ecosystem based adaptation uh, ecosystem based adaptation that uh, uh, is very very uh, potential for Lao country to to build capacity in the right now to long-term planning to, to protection uh, that's uh, our project we allocate that uh, in our downstreams we investment in small scale infrastructure in related to water resource and the upstream we uh, make land use planning and for uh, forest protection and for provide water source to lower lower as uh, 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 those streams. With this regards, we assign uh, our team as uh, Mr. Anders Posens, who is the CTA of the project. Uh, now he's sitting here, and he will uh, give us a detail of the project implementations. Uh, he also representative of the UNDP the country best in Lao PDR and also representative of Lao dedicate yeah, to make uh, present about sharing information, uh, sharing uh, lesson learned of the project implementation in Laos that supported by uh, UNDPs. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, your questions, your comments, your advice, we are welcome. Yeah. So uh, please address your your floor. Thank you, Manchai. And thank you, everybody, for showing up on this Friday after lunch. And first of all, let me say that um, this is a total experience of Laos and Timor Leste. We even brought tropical climate with us into the room. So, but I hope you can keep warm. So yes, um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, go through a little bit quick, I think, uh, the, the slides we have. And I'm doing it a little bit different from Timor Leste because our projects are quite similar. We, we don't have a road component, but otherwise our projects are, bit, uh, are similar. They are funded by the same organization, supported by UNDP, um, and implemented by the government with the same uh, the same budget, actually. So I'm going to take take uh, the point of departure from something that um, um, Dave from Timor Leste also covered, namely nature-based solutions for rural community and 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 um, water infrastructure in Laos. Um, and nature-based solutions. I've also been to a few side events here where this is really much talked about at the moment. And there's, uh, there's this um, international declaration on nature-based solutions for water management on the climate change that has just recently been, been um, um, put forward. And um, this is just a few quotes that I found in, in this declaration. Nature-based solutions provide multiple benefits. They're not just um, fulfilling single objectives. They can provide both mitigation and adaptation at the same time. They can increase resilience to different climate events, and they can provide uh, safe drinking water, food security, and human health. And in the in the declaration, also uh, it, uh, 
there's a commitment to combine nature-based solutions with civil engineering, like we've heard also from Timo Leste today. So this is actually my point of departure, this combining nature-based solutions with civil engineering, because it's easy to talk about, but maybe not so easy to actually do. Um, so my presentation will mainly be about that. But first, um, yeah, this is just a, a nice photo from Laos. Um, I think it's good to look at a picture like that when you're sitting here in cold northern Europe. Um, but it also illustrates the linkage between forests and water and how water is actually embedded in ecosystems. It's not something separate. But most, of, most, of, most countries, they have water management and forest management under separate um, departments, several, sometimes even several separate ministries. Um, and that, that creates some difficulties when you need to, when you need to coordinate. So this is, uh, this is what I'm going to cover a little bit, uh, this presentation. But first I'll do a little quick introduction to Laos, if, uh, just to, to tease you to visit the country. Um, and then what, what, what are the issues related to climate change in Laos? And then go a little bit, not as detailed as Timo Leste, because as I said, um, we have similar projects, but a little bit about our project. And then finally, um, I'm talk about what are the what what are the possible entry point for entry points for combining nature-based solutions with engineering. So, this is uh, a picture that really captures Laos, Laos very well. Um, as Vansha said, a lot of mountains, a lot of beautiful mountains, um, and then lowland rice production. And uh, this is a map of, of the country. Uh, so, uh, as it was mentioned in, uh, in, the, in the photo uh, story, it's a landlocked country between Vietnam, Thailand, Myanmar, China, and Cambodia. And some basic facts um, about Laos, the area and population, almost seven, seven million. And uh, a large ethnic diversity in, in the country. Uh, 20, 20, uh, 49, sorry, 49 different ethnic groups, uh, of which the largest, the largest ethnic group is Lao Lum, which uh, consists of 68% of the population. Uh, the Mekong is quite uh, an important feature of the country. 85% of the country is within the uh, Mekong Basin, and 60% of the entire length of the river um, runs along or through Laos. Um, the climate in Laos, tropical monsoon, with a very distinct rainy season and dry season, and then also a cold season uh, from December to February. Um, but, but this distinction, very, very distinct rainy season and, and dry season makes, um, makes also a challenge in terms of adapting to climate change because many, many, many places are affected by both at different times of the year, both, both drought and flood. And this I'll, I'll come back to. This is a copy of um, the socioeconomic development plan for Laos. And I, it was completed uh, in 2015. It covers 2016 to 20. As you can see, it, uh, it has the sustainable de development goals on the front page, so the, the SDGs have already been in incorporated into the planning in Laos. The main priority for uh, the Lao uh, development is to graduate from least development status, least development country status by 2020. But the plan also mentioned, uh, mentions minimizing greenhouse gas emissions as a priority. Adapt, adapting to climate change and integrating climate change into sector plans and re increase forest cover of the whole nation to up to 70%. Um, these are uh, sort of the, broadly speaking, the predicted climate change in, in Laos. Um, and, and as you can see, 
it's very much related to the monsoon season. Um, there's an expectation of, of an increased annual rainfall, but it's going to be uh, combined with a longer dry season, so the increased rainfall will happen in a shorter period of time in the monsoon season. So as a consequence, more intense uh, rain, which therefore makes, makes it prone to more, more um, flash floods and erosion. And yeah, these, are the, these, are, these will then be the consequences of, of these climate changes. And if I'll just touch on one example from a, a climate event that happened in, in 2009, because that's, that's also very uh, significant for the project area we are working in. And it also illustrates that Laos is lying in this typhoon uh, zone you know, of, of Southeast Asia. And usually, when you, have, when you hear the global news, you hear about uh, uh, tragedy and devastation in Philippines and in, in this case also Vietnam. Um, but then by the time, as you can see, by the time it reached Laos, it was downgraded into a tropical dep depression and disappeared from the news. But that does not mean that, that it did not have any more effects. Um, it actually had significant effects in Laos. Um, and these are some of them, uh, this destroyed infrastructure. Um, one in the, the one on the, on the left in Saravan province, which is the, uh, one of the provinces we're working in. The other one is Sekong province, which we're also working in. So a little bit about the project. So very similar to the Timor-Leste project. So we're working in this area of southern Laos. Um, these are the two provinces, a little bit closer shot. And as you can see, as typical for the rest of Laos, mountain areas combined with lowland rice fields. Um, and in our projects, we have implemented uh, 29 infrastructure projects combined with uh, e an ecosystem-based adaptation or nature-based solutions. Um, and these projects cover 14 irrigation projects, um, six water supply projects, two flood gate improvements, five community bridge projects, and then two check dam projects. And just to give you a little bit of, of, uh, of feel for what type of project we have, this is a water supply system. Um, and it combines, as you can see, there's a mountain in the background. Um, and that, that's part of the project because that is, that is uh, um, quite deforested. And the part of the project is also to establish management, forest management, together with the local communities uh, in, in the upstream watershed. Um, because the climate issue here is, is, is drought and a lowering of, continuous lowering of the, of the groundwater levels. And, uh, and this is a, a, a cul flood culvert in relation to uh, uh, an irrigation system. The, as you, I don't know if you can see on the picture, but on the, on the right, uh, there's the old pipe culvert. You can hardly see it, but it, it, it was, the dimensions were not enough to, to, to uh, release the floods during the, mon during the monsoon season, so it, it actually caused a lot of, of uh, crop damage. Now the project has um, constructed this bigger uh, culvert, ensuring that, um, that the, the, the crop damages are reduced and is combined with, with bioengineering, like, um, like uh, similar to the Timor-Leste case. And this is a, a wetland uh, project that combines this, um, this infrastructure, uh, which is a kind of a dike to protect to, to maintain water during the dry season because the issue here was uh, that this was how the wetland looked in 2014 when we pro the project started. Uh, no water during the dry season. And this picture is taken at the same time of year, uh, this year actually, during the time of visit of Timor Leste. So um, there's a big difference, that it means a big difference also for the local community. You can see the map also, um, 
this is actually what, uh, the, what um, uh, Banchai was talking about, the land use planning that we're doing together with the, with the uh, infrastructure as part of the ecosystem-based uh, adaptation. Um, and I'll come back to that again. So combining nature-based solutions and water infrastructure. The challenge is that, as I mentioned, the institutional boundaries uh, between ecosystems, forests, wetlands, and um, sector, sector uh, agencies like agriculture for irrigation systems, the Ministry of Health also for, for water supply. So all these institutional boundaries uh, create uh, difficulties or challenges. And also infrastructure planners and ecosystem specialists are not used to communicate. Um, so, so, uh, so that's, uh, that's and, and we have, we have uh, experienced that also in our project in the early days that it, it, was, it was a challenge. So uh, how, do we, uh, uh, how do we solve that or get over those challenges? Um, so uh, this is sort of a typical planning cycle, annual planning cycle for infrastructure projects in Laos. Um, we've been using a system which is called district development fund mechanism. Um, but Laos is also now embarking on a, on a, a, a decentralization or devolution of, of, of decision making to the local, local level. And, and this is this this cycle of, of uh, the annual cycle of planning is, is actually will, will, will fit any any uh, local planning cycle. So from planning to prioritization to budgeting to designing and implementing and monitoring and then back to the, to the next annual cycle. So where can we wh what can we do to incorporate um, the the nature thinking the nature based solutions into, into that planning cycle. One of the things that we did in our project, um, we did this climate risk and vulnerability assessment and, and, and incorporated nature-based, larger scale ecosystem-based adaptation into that process. Um, and then, as we mentioned before, land use planning. Once you have identified what are the the potential for ecosystem-based adaptation in an area, then you have to incorporate that also in the land use um, process. Laos is in the process of developing a national land use planning that involves both, both the district level and uh, but also the community level. So we're both a, a, a bottom-up process. And then last but not least, of course, the local communities, they have to be, they have to be the center of, of, of gravity in terms of both uh, prioritizing, prioritizing um, the needs at the, at the village level and also um, part of the planning and part of, of, um, of um, making sure that ecosystem nature-based solutions are, are actually sustained in the future because the local communities are the ones that will, will manage the area uh, uh, in the, in, after, for example, our project finishes, um, so, so we have to make sure that local communities are capacitated to, to do that. Um, so uh, one by one, I'll go to this is, this is uh, the climate risk and vulnerability assessment that, that um, I, I mentioned before. And this is, I'll actually spend a little bit of time on that because that's sort of the main area where we incorporated um, um, ecosystem-based, nature-based solutions. So you can see we have we did it at three, three levels, three scales, at the project sites and at the surroundings of the project and the community around the, com uh, the project, um, and then at the larger scale watershed area. So combining these uh, scales into one vulnerability assessment um, is important as we for to, to sort of merge the nature-based approach with the um, engineering approach. And this, of course, requires that we have, you have uh, on the CRVA assessment team, you have people who, 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 uh, who cover all these specialties and also people who, who can communicate uh, beyond their own uh, specialty. 
and the, CR, the CRVA, as we call it, they involve uh, both district and community cons consultations at the district level, did the more sort of larger scale um, assessment and, uh, and, and the community level, which was more like specifically for, for the project sites. Um, if, we, if we look at the district, um, the district consultation first, so part of that was to, to, to gather local knowledge from the district, um, the various district departments, about where are the, the key um, climate issues, where are the key ecosystem areas of, of the area, um, and then combine that into sort of district participatory mapping. And, and this is um, an outcome of that process. You have the colored area, this is a, 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 um, a, sort of a flood area of the two provinces based on the color, the color area is based on, on um, climate forecasting, uh, climate modeling, so science, science, scientific data. And the, the various colored um, uh, areas are, are based on the, the district uh, mapping. So you can see there are some overlaps, but there are also some distinct areas that was not covered by the climate modeling but uh, was captured by, by local knowledge from the district areas. And this is the same, same for the uh, drought hotspots. And particularly there, you see that there was a lot of, um, of areas that was missed by the, the climate modeling. Um, and then we did the CRVA at each of the sites and each of the communities. And this is um, all the, the, the sites where we did CRVA. And as you can see, many, most of them, most of them have uh, high or very high climate threats uh, of, 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 uh, of floods. Um, many, many have have uh, both drought and flood threats at the in the same in the same village, really. So this is uh, this is one of the challenges that uh, we have everywhere in Laos. This is just an example of, 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 map, of putting, putting all this information together and then come up with, with uh, so we, 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 we assess uh, exposure, sensibility, impacts, and adapt, adaptive capacity, and then we have a scale for vulnerability. And through that process, we can identify what are the, the uh, most high priority interventions. Um, and, this, and the, the final part of the CRVA is to identify the adaptation options based on the vulnerability assessment. And they were, the adaptation options were grouped into five different types of adaptation options. So the three first are sort of mainly engineering, whereas the two last ones here are the nature-based so solutions. So by combining those um, those into the CRVA, those both the engineering and nature-based solutions into the engineering, in, into the CRVA, it's possible to come up with, um, to integrate the two better. Um, but it, it requires, of course, that, as I said before, that there are people on the, t on the assessment team that cover both areas. Yeah, and then uh, prior, based on uh, prioritizing, all, identifying all the different options and then prioritizing them and you can see the, the dark red ones are the very high priority ones, and these ones are the nature-based uh, adaptation solutions. And land use planning, finally, uh, um, land use planning, as I mentioned already before. So, so once we've identified a, 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 a possible ecosystem intervention, um, we have to do land use planning in the area because we have to make sure that it, it, it fits into uh, all the plans for the area. So uh, this is this is the one that's sort of the larger scale district area. This is, if you remember the picture of the of the water tower and the mountain in the in the background, this is actually the mountain. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about w what are the categories because we, this is sort of beyond the point. But then we also base uh, we also did at community level, so at participatory land use planning at the community level to identify where are the the, uh, the, the main areas for potential in, uh, intervention, uh, for example, 
erosion areas along rivers um, uh, or landslide prone areas um, and that's that's where we can we can identify uh, or sit in with with uh, you know, with uh, interventions yeah and then last of course but not least again local communities um, and again he would, gender was mentioned before it's important to make sure that local communities means both men and women and here are uh, interviews with uh, or focus group discussions with both women group and men group and and, and local co communities actually in Laos they have a lot of of um, we always talk about local communities as as low capacity in, in terms of adapting but they actually in Laos they have a lot of capacity because they're used to annual floods and annual drought it's just that when they come in becoming more ex extreme and more frequent more, more frequent extreme flooding uh, longer droughts then, then they, they face difficulties but it's important to build on on the capacity that's already there in the, in the local communities and they also I mean uh, in the area that you've seen where things have been washed away through during the typhoon um, um, local people realize uh, firsthand it has a, it has an impact if if the upstream areas are deforested, for example. So they are very uh, very um, adapt to, uh, adapt to, um, to 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 this idea of nature-based solutions. They also rely a lot on nature, um, and they are also less they are less um, sort of this thing about different different sectors. They are less, less sector-bound. They think a little bit more holistic. So I, it's, it's important to build on that. Yeah, so this uh, was the last one. So I'll just uh, ask the team of Lester some key messages. Nature based for rural water infrastructure will require working at multiple scales, integration into existing planning mechanisms, collaboration across institutional boundaries, collaboration between infrastructure engineers and ecosystem specialists, and working with local communities. And then the value of partnerships and South South cooperation. I mean, this, this whole event is based on um, a visit from Timor Leste to Laos earlier this year. And uh, I think we realized both countries that it's quite valuable to exchange experience We're between two countries that are sort of having similar development challenges, although we are very different um, um, in terms of one being an island and one being landlocked but but uh, some uh, some similar development challenges and some similar aspirations like graduating from LDC status it makes exchanging ideas a lot more relevant so uh, I, I think that's uh, that's also a valuable lesson to take uh, take away from from this so that was my presentation thank you very much Thank you, Anders. Uh, right, ladies and gentlemen, now I think I would like to invite a question from the floor. It can be all comments, suggestions, or recommendations, or questions, or anything you are interested in the, these two projects that is done on crowd. Um, please. Can, can we have a, a microphone? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Congratulations to the team from Laos and Timor Leste having um, presented their projects which have they, have they have implemented. By the way, my, my name is Julian Duzrez from Timor Leste, by the way. Um, uh, of course, the reason I'm, I'm I'm going to ask questions because I wasn't involved or being part of the project, so I have curiosity. I'd like to ask um, the team that have, uh, of course, directly implementing the, the projects. Um, of course, through the presentation, uh, as far as my concern in the information you have provided, it seems that the, the project has been very comprehensive. It has been uh, very integrated, given the fact that you have considered all aspects uh, in terms of working with the government, the community, and so on. 
Um, after all that, of course, you guys know a lot more than each of us sitting in this room. So I, I'd like to ask perhaps like, uh, what, is your view, what is your view going forward? How realistic was that uh, for, um, uh, for projects like this being implemented? And how realistic are you looking to the future in terms of LDCs and SEEDs uh, responding to climate change, for instance? Because you know, knowing the fact that you know, throughout the negotiation we have uh, experienced a lot of uh, struggle in terms of uh, enhancing uh, climate finance allocation and also the support of uh, developing uh, developed countries. And so, uh, and then that's that's the first question: is how realistic are you looking at the f to the future in terms of small countries responding to climate change? And uh, secondly, working with the government, uh, what is the, their ownership over the project? Like, what is are they reluctant to be part of that? Are they supportive? And if, if, if you've uh, faced some struggles in the process, how would you have addressed that in, in this case? Thank you very much. Thank you. For, while waiting for, okay, another, another question here, please. Can we have a microphone? Thank you. My name is Punton Chantalabung. I'm from Alliance for Democracy in Laos. I have a question for you, UNPD and Lao government today. Uh, your project is very interesting, but in Laos, uh, the Lao people, they don't have right to speak. Uh, they don't have right of speech, of assembly, of press, and so on. How can the Lao people um, have this, pro this project with you? In Laos, we have big problem with corruption, with land grabbing. Now, uh, the land grabbing in Laos, more than 13% are now for uh, um, investor. And we need now uh, every project from you together with the Lao people. We need um, independent NGO in Laos for this project. Yes, I have a question for you. How um, difficult for your project in Laos with this problem? Thank you. Thank you. Um, shall we take these two questions first, and then uh, uh, we, I will ask my panelists here to answer to your question first, and then we'll take on another uh, question later. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, I, I think the second question was for uh, for Lao. Uh, I mean, I'll uh, try to talk a little bit. The question came from Timor Leste. I mean, on the on the on the issue of uh, integrating climate change uh, issue into the uh, rural infrastructure project, uh, I've been working in the in the local development program, or local development project over the last uh, twelve years, uh, and uh, and since before the 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 SSRI small scale rural infrastructure program was brought into the country in two thousand and twelve. What uh, has happened in the country since uh, since 2002, when we got the independence, was that uh, all the the focus of the building the infrastructure was to build the infrastructure. Uh, uh, there is no such uh, discussion about uh, 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 mainstreaming uh, the policies or the issues of climate change into all the infrastructure development. With the with the with the small scale rural infrastructure, with the UNDP project uh, fund, funded through through the GF by the GF, has uh, provided a lesson to the government of Timor Leste, particularly for for the for the government institutions that are responsible for the rural infrastructure in Timor Leste. Particular in this in this in this in in, in this in this particular case is the municipalities in Timor Leste, to start to think about trying to uh, consider. Uh, Climate change uh, adaptation into the in in the in the design 
uh, in the in the design and also construction of the rural rural infrastructure program. This program only implemented in three municipalities of 30 municipalities in Timor Leste. Uh, these are Ermera, Baukawen, uh, and Likisa. But uh, that is first of all, this program is uh, is not is not inventing a new wheel uh, in terms of the planning process, the local planning process. But it uses the existing mechanism that uh, uh, that, that currently exists in the country at the village level as well as at the municipal level. But uh, before the, pro the project was there, all the infrastructure that was built were only for the for the sake of the infrastructure, but not considering climate change. But this one has given us the the, the, experience, the experience about uh, integrating climate change into issue into the project uh, design and costing. So, uh, for the future, uh, what uh, we think is, is is important is that th this project has been implemented for three years. Now, the lesson that we learn is that uh, when you have a, when you do a little bit more work in the costing and design of the project, and also the infra in the cost, uh, the development of the infrastructure itself, uh, uh, by integrating the uh, climate resilience uh, issue into that, those projects, it will make the project like uh, 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 more, uh, you know, it's more sustainable. It will have a long life uh, when as compared to the project that does not consider the, the climate change uh, issue. So uh, for, the, I mean, for, for Timor-Leste, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to uh, I mean, with this this, this experience, uh, we we hope we can we can try to uh, talk with our government departments uh, that are responsible for the infrastructure, uh, in particular the rural infrastructure, in order to uh, integrate climate change issue into the project costing and project design in the future. It has already started with the with the project that's been implemented in the P P at the village level and at at the at the municipal level. So that was the first the first I mean, part of the question. The first question, and the second question was about the ownership of the project. I mean, for the case of Timor Leste, I mean, I, I was uh, I was uh, as, as uh, I was I was mentioning, the project used the existing mechanism that the government actually has. So, so the the program that, that is funded through the GEF uh, man, and, uh, and managed by the UNDP used the existing system. So all are uh, all, all the systems are owned by the government, and the government uh, officers, both at the national level as well as at the municipal level, they are the ones who, who manage the program in terms of the planning as well as implementation. I mean, even uh, I mean, during the evaluation of this project, they are also involved with that. But, uh, you know, I mean, as, uh, as experiences that I've seen also in other countries, uh, limited capacity uh, at the local level in, uh, in managing programs such as like this, I mean, that now, I mean, now we have the climate change uh, components into the project construct, project design and, uh, and, and, and development. It, it, it needs uh, as, uh, enough capacity building uh, to be, to be uh, made to our civil service at the local level in order to, to develop this, pro to, 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 be, to be involved in the implementation of those, the, this kind of project. So that's what I can uh, share uh, when they, in terms of the experience from, from Timor Leste. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so I'll cover the, also the first question first. Um, uh, Miguel has said a lot, some that which is also applies for Laos. Um, and all, as I particularly, I mean, we, uh, sustainability is also a challenge when you have a, a four-year, uh, four or five-year project. That cover that that is meant to to cover um, um, some something related to climate resilience, and particularly when you involve ecosystem and nature-based solutions. Like, if you recall the 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 picture with the with the mountain in the background, it, it takes a lot more than five years to rehabilitate a, an ecosystem like that. So, um, so we uh, can only set the set the thing in motion and. Uh, whatever happens after our project is out of our hands. Uh, we can try to ensure as much as possible that, that there's something that, that will sustain, but um, uh, we cannot be sure. So that's, that is a challenge. And many of these uh, nature-based solutions require really a lot longer perspective, a lot long, longer time perspectives. Um, 
yeah, uh, in terms of implementing at the local level in Laos, um, I understand your question, um, and uh, Manchai will, will also provide some answers. Uh, our project was focused in on, on a, a real, real need in the, at the local level, which is rural infrastructure, and particularly in some of the, some of the areas we work in, in remote mountainous areas, uh, there's a real need for improving livelihoods and improving um, uh, yeah, the whole, the whole uh, sustainability and resilience of, of communities. So that was our focus. Uh, all any any b any bigger issues uh, is out of our hands, really. Oh, right. Hello, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, the question one uh, about the 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 trend, the future, what uh, Laos planning for uh, develop for for. For the for the future, um, as I mentioned before, that the, and Anders also said that our project is uh, is pilot projects. Uh, they supported from, from UNDP to uh, first one for capacity building in the planning, and second one we 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 do uh, investment in small scale projects for lunar for for communities, and the third one is is. Uh, we, we Lao PDR. We have already of the national strategy on uh, agric uh, ministry, uh, agriculture and forest. That's already mentioned that uh, year of 2020, the forest cover should be 20 uh, percent. That, that is so. They, they, this the the uh, pilot project. We based on this and we learn from the CRVA that there's. Uh, and there's mentioned a lot of the CRVA, so we we learn from this, and now is 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 work. I would say I'm a project manager. This project, so I would say is works. We can apply for another province, because our pro this project only apply only to to provinces. So is tr try, uh, we learn from them, and which ones good we can extension apply to the. Uh, another alias, and which one is not good, we, we can approve the, this pilot project. Uh, and also we have the another project that now in the uh, uh, planning that uh, we need the as vulnerability assessment index for vulnerability assessment from the climate change impacts to, it's mean for the whole countries we will, do, we will do in the future, nearly, very nearly, you start. So. And the second question is the about the partnership. Partnership is um, now uh, maybe our presentation is not covered about uh, about the Samsung. Samsung Lao government uh, uh, already announced of the Samsung. Samsung is mean uh, three views. Three, three view is partnerships. Uh, what is one view? One view is national level. National level, what to do? For the national government should be uh, making the strategy. Is only the, in the mandate. The second, second building is for uh, provincial level. Is planning, uh, social economic planning is burned from the um, uh, provincial. And what is the third one? Third view is from the community. Is district level. A district level view implementing any activities. Even of the government projects, even of the donor projects, a chance from the UNDP support projects, and the support from UNEP or another UN, something. So the the kumban, the communities, you implementing the projects, is mean who you do implementing the project is mean the benefit should be come to the implementer, something, something. I would say like that. And the third question is, is quite quite new and in the in the in the past my experience I don't heard something like this. But let, let me share for you that uh, um, as I well understood that the Lao government now in national Emba Assembly. National M Assembly government already established the especially Door, 
is mean urgently do. So many people can call if you have problem. If you if you found the problems, any problems, if you don't like, unlike, you can call this door. Number is in the public. So any, so it's open. So I don't I don't I don't know that uh, um, uh, your your question that uh, we we my mind I, I answer is I like or, or not but I well understood that the government already established special door in belong of the national assembly so many people can call immediately if you find a problem and even UNDP in Laos, UNEF or any agency come to uh, cooperation with the government sectors to develop the projects. That's we 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 follow that the Wang Chan statement. That mean win-win cooperation. So we, we cannot we cannot do anything without uh, this document. So, so even private sectors, uh, UNDP, UN agency or UN. Uh, you, you, NGO as your questions. So we can we can make cooperation with any agency, UN agency, belong of the Wang Chan statement, win-win cooperation. So that's in my mind. I I would like to share something for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think what he means is a hotline, National Assembly hotline, that you can call any time if you have any questions. Uh, next, uh, if I may invite uh, some more questions from the floor. Now, to be said in reference to the partnership definition, I would like to inquire about uh, what is it in public-private pu partnership logic. Uh, for example, in France, I build a highway, so I have uh, 50 years time to get back my money on the highway. Or in others, I pay, uh, I uh, establish a harbor, or and so on. So, w is there any how to say? understanding any installation by law, by national law, so that one could open a public-private partnership in the saying like that, uh, okay, I want to have this mountain there, I want to transform it into a, how to say, livelihood, I want to do, I want to do it into a watershed, whatever, you, just for example in that sense. Is there any uh, forecast in this sense? Um, thank you. Uh, we only have uh, a few minutes left. Uh, if I may invite our panelists to to address the question. Uh, thank you for your question. But uh, your question is, uh, is not related to our project. Please come to focusing our projects. Um, yeah, because um, I, I, we don't know the case of your, your, your face in the past. Yeah, so uh, please come it to our just, projects. It was just in concern about how learning from what comes into existence. So by this uh, invitation, lear to learn how do others this was a basic and, uh, of organizing the funding and uh, organizing to come back as a revolving funding in that sense. So this is, was a basic interest uh, because then one can really adapt the means and one doesn't have to inquire each time for every screw or every way I do in that sense. But you can copy it, but 50 years I have, for example, my chance to, get, to come back on my roof. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I I think I might understand your question. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that that is a that, that is also a concern. Uh, and for example, many of these infrastructures may in two years' time be washed away again by another storm. 
uh, so what 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 do you do then or or if if some small parts of the infrastructure is break, break, breaking down what do you do um, and for example the water supply projects we is also a picture of um, we create um, uh, uh, um, user group around the, uh, the, the the infrastructure and they actually pay per use of water to uh, what you would uh, revolving or to a fund the a village fund that they can then use for maintenance and operation and if it becomes bigger big enough they can use it for any other livelihood uh, activity in the village so um, so uh, so it but it's Im that's an important element of these projects actually that there is something left in the community the community has capacity but also has sort of financial capacity to to take it forward and make it sustainable and build on it uh, even further um, and and that's just another challenge in a, in a in a five four, four year five year project, um, because it requires a lot of uh, of uh, capacity development. Um, but but uh, and, and in some of the infrastructure projects, uh, it's more successful than others. Uh, but it certainly is, and particularly also when you look at the larger scale ecosystem work. Um, how how can you? create something that that will also have financial resources for for the next 10 15 20 years because that's what requires required for uh, for uh, yeah, rehabilitating ecosystems for, um, so so that's that is a challenge yeah I, I don't have a, a foolproof solution for that actually And on the public-private partnership, um, I mean, as I understood your question correctly, um, uh, it's be, I mean, there, there is a, there is a legislation already I mean, approved by the government in order to regulate how I mean the involvement of the private sectors in the in a, either in the form of a, uh, purely run by the private sector or uh, I mean, uh, jointly run by the state or the government as well as uh, with the, with the, with them with private, private sectors uh, we've uh, uh, we've had a couple of uh, a government project which uh, used already public private partnership i mean starting from i mean mainly there are uh, bigger infrastructure projects uh, such as the construction of um, uh, of a port uh, in one of the uh, in one of the I mean one of the site there in, in, in Timor Leste, which is like more than 400 million US dollar, uh, but uh, but it comes with uh, with terms and conditions uh, about how um, uh, uh, I mean agreement is reached with the government. I mean one of the examples, for example, when they're discussing about the, this contract, specific contract that I was referring to about the, the construction of the port. The, the private sector uh, specifically mentioned uh, or, 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 or requires the government not to approve uh, other construction of port in, in, the, in, in, in the adjacent of 200 kilometers from that part of the, of the port. I mean, things like that. And we are also, I mean, uh, things that are related to the climate change um, are also trying to uh, engage the private sectors in order to uh, uh, manage the solid waste management, which actually also to some extent at the moment in Timor Leste contributes to the emission of uh, CO2 and methane uh, gas into the atmosphere. Uh, I mean, Delhi municipality, uh, I mean, every day at the moment produce uh, approximately <coughs> uh, 120 tons of uh, 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 rubbish, uh, uh, but that's that's only 45 percent of it. That's been uh, now at the moment dumped at the open dump in one of the sites there in Timor. However, 65% of them are actually, uh, you know, or either they go to the drainage, go to the beach, or go sea, or go to the, I mean, uh, uh, um, get burned by the by the people. So, uh, so so there is a there is a big uh, investment project going on now in, uh, uh, for the management of the solid waste in Delhi, in which uh, uh, 20 million US dollar project have been proposed and. Uh, private sectors have been invited 
in order to to manage uh, this kind of project. And I will look when the government is is planning to to fund for that by, for example, in this case, uh, providing all the infrastructure capital infrastructure such as uh, vehicles as well as uh, equipments, uh, uh, and it will uh, like to have uh, private uh, contractors in order to to, to, to have a, a performance contract with the government in order to, to manage the solid waste management itself. So, so there is, uh, uh, in fact, uh, a, 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 a legis laws and legislation uh, pertaining to the public-private partnership that we hope is not only for the bigger infrastructure project that I, I, I mentioned, but also for other small-scale uh, uh, infrastructure also uh, in the country. I hope that I answered a little bit of your question. Thank you. Um, thank so, you. Do, do we still have time? Or uh, no. I will accept one more question, but please stick, stick to the project. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, thank Actually, you. Actually, my question is just uh, uh, adding on the sustainability of the project outcomes, which is very impressive, especially the wetland one. Uh, wetland one. Um, is there like monitoring mechanisms in place from the UNDP or also from the side of the government? Is there some kind of follow up on the project outcomes? Because as as I understood it, like the project was already like is uh, running out right now in this year. So, how do we actually build on this on the project outcome to sustain the? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, sustainability is a major concern of ours, and um, <coughs> and um, um, there is. Um, um, we, we are building on existing mechanisms at the local level um, in terms of, uh, of planning, district planning, and that also includes monitoring. Um, um, but our effort has also been on actually working with the villages to, to, uh, to make sure that they have the capacity and they have means to develop, to develop their own funds to, to maintain um, these infrastructures. Um, but otherwise, it's it's really uh, and, and and there's there's a, there's a sort of a a follow up project, not not a directly follow up project, but there's a, a project uh, continuing with the, the, this whole planning mechanism where we are, we are we are building our our um, processes into that, so that hopefully and that will carry on for the next five ten years, and hopefully by then there will be sustainability incorporated, but. But uh, still, uh, with that, um, we we of course we are we are aware. But 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 as much as I say, this is a pilot project. So, by the nature of pilot projects, requires that we take the results we have and use them and document them, and make sure that um, that they build upon uh, for future projects, uh, for future processes within the local government. As much as I say, the Samsung um, program. Um, this is where these these things can pot potentially be uh, mainstreamed and become sustainable. But I think, as as with many projects, many short-term projects, sustainability is always an issue. I, I just want to take two minutes to answer two questions. Going back to the question of what is the view going forward and how realistic small countries, LDCs and SIDS can respond to the climate change. If uh, that's a question from uh, Julie, Mr. Julio, yeah? So I will just uh, answer that one and on the sustainability uh, that was uh, done, how in Timor-Leste this project was able to build on those that were implemented and sustain uh, the outcomes. Um, for SIDS and LDC, uh, I mean, my colleagues had mentioned that these projects are piloted projects, and as in all cases for small projects like these, which are like 4.9 million, there is not um, um, there is not allocation for, for for them to be sustained in in the financing being sustained continuously in in the country. So for SIDS and LDC, that is why projects like these are working with the existing system. As in the case of Timor-Leste, it is the PDIM system that the capacity, the institutional capacity, ownership can be built so that all future projects, whether it's from grants, loans, or from national budget, can incorporate the climate uh, resilience element in it. It is uh, not, uh, we should ask ourselves um, if we continue with the business as usual scenario, 
What are the impacts on infrastructure? Would they can they be sustained with climate change imposing on countries, shorter return periods for like flo floods, droughts as well are becoming more prevalent, um, uh, other climate hazards. Uh, so this is the question that SIDS and LDC should ask that not only depending on the, uh, not only uh, financing from loans and grants, but also national financing, all infrastructure projects should adopt climate resilience as, as part of its, um, as part of its, its outcome. I mean, one of the things I want to mention too is, and I think it was uh, discussed in the presentation, is that infrastructure were seen that it was an engineering um, aspect, hard engineering. But now the agronomists, the engineers, the environmentalists all have to sit and work together collaboratively to implement infrastructure. We have seen this case in Timor-Leste where engineers design roads, but we have not had the input of the agronomists in the bioengineering aspect, the right selection of species and how the plants are growing cause these kinds of... Um, so that's one issue that needs to be... Oh, everyone needs to sit and work collaboratively. On the question of sustainability of the outcomes, uh, when uh, projects like these come to small uh, countries and uh, they are small allocation, there is no, not a maintenance budget allocated. To it. So the project ends this year and there is no maintenance budget. How are the outcomes sustained? And that is why it's important to work with the existing system. Uh, we have been uh, building roads, water supply system, irrigation scheme in this project. For the roads in particular, they were harmonized with the Rural Roads Master Plan of Timor-Leste. So once the roads were constructed, they were handed over to the Ministry of Public Works and all maintenance responsibilities there henceforth would be taken on by the ministry. So indefinitely, it will go on for the next uh, 10, 20 years and I'm sure those roads would still exist once there is allocation in maintenance. For the irrigation schemes, we have seen that uh, the multi-use irrigation schemes um, were very effective in that they created water users group and they were uh, managing those um, in, in a way that uh, were serving their interest. We tried to use simple components, so these water supply systems were not very complex, so it was easy to manage, easy to maintain, easy to operate. So less complex components for rural infrastructure when it's very difficult to ac access these, um, these, uh, these parts or components when it's deteriorated. So I, I'm not sure if I've answered your questions, but th this is my input on those two. And there are many others if we could discuss uh, in, in later. Thank you. Thank you. If I may uh, ask for a round of applause for my panelists, please. <laughs> thank you, and thank you all for coming. And I wish you a very good trip back home, since it is the final day of the COF, and everybody should be out there enjoying uh, Bonn and shopping. See you next year. Mm.